Good afternoon, as well as good evening and good morning, and a very warm welcome on behalf of FISA and Bernan Van Leer Foundation to all of you who are joining us from all around the globe. We are delighted to see such a large number of participants. Further engagement amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, challenges, promising approaches and opportunities is the title of today's webinar. My name is Constantina Renzo, and I'm a senior program manager at ISA, the International Step-by-Step -Step Association. For those of you who do not know us, ISA is a membership association powered by close to 100 organizations working in the early childhood field, primarily in Europe and Central Asia. Our work revolves around quality, equity, and a high quality workforce in early childhood services. The topic of today's webinar is not new to ESA. ESA has been promoting father's engagement in the supporting families for nurturing care package, a resource modules for professional development of home visitors developed by ESA and UNICEF. In addition, with, with co in collaboration with the Center of Social Studies at Coimbra University, ESA has recently started implementing the Engaging Men in Nurturing Care initiative funded by Oak Foundation. The initiative aims to lay the foundations for a multi-year engaging men and promoting positive gender norms in early childhood initiative in Portugal and other European countries. Given the challenges and opportunities the COVID-19 pandemic has created in terms of gender equity in parenting and father engagement, Today's webinar aims to shed light into how we can support increased paternal engagement and responsible co-parenting. Before I introduce you to today's panelists, I would like to give you some technical information. During the webinar, we are going to have two polls and we are going to ask you to connect to www.menti.com and to enter to the box the code 77020006. We are going to repeat the code and the website when the time comes, and my colleague Teresa is also going to share them in the chat box. We would also like to invite you to use the chat box to share your comments and also to use the Q&A section to share your questions. We plan to have short sessions of questions and answers throughout our webinar. So please feel free to share your thoughts with us. We will select a few questions and we will address them later. The webinar is recorded and we will share the recording with all of you who registered, so you may also choose to share it further among your networks. Of course, this webinar would not be feasible without the contribution of our panelists. We are honored to introduce you, the four experts who accepted our invitation to participate in our webinar. Today, we have with us Tatiana Moura, Senior Researcher at the Center for Social Studies, University of Coimbra, Portugal, and Coordinator of Promudo Portugal. Between 2011 and 2019, Tatiana was the Executive Director of Instituto Promudo in Brazil. Tatiana holds a PhD in Peace, Conflicts and Democracy. Mariam Badzelanze, Program Manager at UNFPA, CEO of Georgia. Mariam has been working on the progressively increasing managerial positions in the private sector and the development field for more than 15 years. Mariam holds a PhD in education management. Alona App is the founder and co-CEO of Hope, of Hope Media Group, a leading media company engaged over the past 20 years in creating, curating, and distributing content across multiple platforms. Alona has extensive experience in all fields of television and media production with a specific focus on children. Last but not least, Josefa Trash, chairman and co-founder at Suf Media and senior advisor at the Arabic version of Magic Moments project. Since the early 2000s, Josef has been a leading character in the Arabic media industry in Israel. A very warm welcome to all four of you, and thank you again for accepting our invitation to participate in this webinar. I have already introduced myself, but I would like to introduce also two persons that you do not see, but they are, at least for me, crucial for the smooth running of today's webinar, as they are providing technical support. My colleagues, Teresa Moreno and Olesia 
Shuk, a communication officer at ESA. And now let's start our webinar with the first poll. As we mentioned earlier, uh, to access this poll, please go to www.menti.com on either your smartphone or your laptop and enter the code 77020006 and you will see the question pop up on your screen. The reason that we are making this specific poll is because we want to get a sense of why so many people are joining us today and why we should focus on further engagement. So we would like to um, ask you to write one or two words that describe the reason that you are all here uh, today. You can start entering the keywords now. We can already see some answers coming in. Uh, we hope that we will soon see more answers on the screen. So it's learn, research, interest, input for curriculum, which is very interesting, dilemmas, uh, be inspired, family, get inspiration, work related. I hope we will have more chances to clarify more some of the keywords used here like the input for the curriculum you might be needed or uh, what it means uh, work related importance of fathers curiosity being a better parent thank you all thank you we will close the um, uh, poll in uh, uh, in one minute so if you have other input, please go ahead and write your motivation for attending this webinar. Programming, father's point of view that would be interested to explore and I hope that our uh, panelists will give us an insight of the father's point of view. Um, we will close the poll now. Thank you to all of you who participated in this poll. It is great to see the variety of, of uh, responses, as we believe that it is a topic that crosses context and in cross it crosses sectors. And we are hoping that uh, through the diverse perspectives of our panelists, we will be able to address some of uh, your questions. So let's start learning from each other and inspiring each other. Uh, I would like first to give the floor to Tatiana, uh, who will walk us through the parent program she is coordinating. Tatiana, how parent program uh, targets the dire directs a targeted response to the need for concrete strategies to engage main, men and males in active fatherhood? Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Constantina. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, my thoughts and solidarity with the colleagues from the US. We have the US elections today and we know that, of course, the personal is political and it is something uh, that uh, we need to reflect uh, on today. So, uh, as Constantina mentioned, I coordinate uh, the project Parent. It's an EU-funded EU project, um, and it is uh, a project that aims to promote fatherhood and caregiving. But first, let me start by uh, giving you some general information about ProMundo's work. Some of you might be familiar with. If not, um, let me tell you that Promundo is an international NGO that was founded in Brazil in 1997. We have now uh, offices in Brazil, in Washington, in the US, in Rwanda, and here in Portugal. Um, the key premises of Promundo's work is that men have multiple roles and identities. So men can and often do want to prevent and challenge violence. So we work uh, from a, a, a non-essentialist point, point of view. And so we consider violence as a learned behavior, of course. So men are not inherently violent. 
this means that also women are not inherently peaceful. So uh, we try to enable change through the research we conduct, we design programs and we conduct advocacy. All our programs uh, go through rigorous impact evaluation and that's why the pilots that we conduct can be replied or adapted in other contexts. The parent project, um, the parent project that we uh, coordinate from, from Portugal is based in a methodology developed uh, in Brazil some years ago, um, program P, and I'll go through program P later. Uh, but if we look at uh, Promundo's research and specifically to the state of the world's fathers from 2019, we see that 80% of fathers say that they would be willing to do anything to be very involved in the early weeks and months of caring for the newly born or adopted child. So our question uh, on that report, but also a question that pays our work is what's holding them back? Next, please. As major barriers and also looking at our State of the World's Father's reports from last year, uh, the major barriers are the lack of adequate paid paternity leave and low take up of leave when it is available, restrictive gender norms that position care as women's responsibility, as women's main, main responsibility, alongside the perception of women as more com competent caregivers than men. So, as I mentioned, based on essentialist, po essentialist points of view, and the lack of economic security and government support for all parents and caregivers. Next, please. In our State of the World's Father's report, uh, we, uh, uh, we call for, for action, of course. Um, and uh, we state that reaching equality in unpaid care and domestic work is an urgent matter of gender justice and women, women's rights. And governments and employers have a role in creating laws and policies that support all parents, caregivers, and families in all their diversity to thrive. So specifically, on the parent project, that's an acronym for promotion, awareness, raising and engagement of men in nurture transformations. Next, please. This is our EU, um, EU project. Um, the, the program and the methodology brings a gender synchronized approach, as I mentioned before, based on our program P, P for father in Portuguese and Spanish, uh, padre and pai. Um, developed, developed in Latin America by Promundo and partners and brings uh, this approach aiming to tackle the challenges of prevention and eradication of violence against women and children. By engaging men in co-responsible parenting and caregiving and promotion, promoting an equal share of unpaid care work in four EU countries, Portugal, Italy, Lithuania and Austria with partners from these, these countries. It's a two, a two year and a half program that will end June next year. Parent uh, wants to contribute to the prevention of domestic and intra-family gender-based violence and violence against children. And it seeks to promote changes in social attitudes and behavior regarding gender roles in caregiving. So uh, its major inspiration was pretty much on our uh, initial program P, uh, that was adapted in several countries in the world already. But besides uh, our colleagues um, from, um, I mean, Georgia and some attempts in Croatia, this is the first comprehensive uh, approach, including an ECD, an early childhood development component. So what are the expected results of, of our parent project? To increase the awareness on the importance of engaging men in active fatherhood and gender equitable caregiving, to promote eradication of violence against women and children on the one side, and the increased engagement of, my, of men as fathers, more gender equitable attitudes and behavior in caregiving and a decrease in violence against women and children. Next please, thank you. So going through in general uh, terms, uh, through the activities, we train healthcare and education professionals using the program PECD, Parenting and Early Childhood Development uh, Methodology. 
um, the Conscious Raising Education Groups for Fathers and their Partners. And uh, the third component is the development of national campaigns to promote, promote gender equitable caregiving and active and engaged fatherhood. Uh, I know Mariam will go through the men care campaign in Georgia. Um, we are uh, adopting and adapting the same uh, approach of the men care global campaign uh, with the key messages developed under that campaign, but also now under this global context with new, with new inputs and, and views. So major target groups, health and ECD professionals, fathers and their partners, including refugees in, and migrants in each country, national and European policy makers and gender equality advocates, and academia and NGO, NGOs that work on gender equality issues across Europe, uh, and uh, more specifically, those who are interested in focusing on masculinities and caregiving. So parents in Portugal, uh, so going deeper into, into the program, uh, is, is the, the partnership in Portugal is the Center for Social Studies, Promundo Portugal, the nursing school and the health ministry. And uh, I, include, uh, I included this information to, to raise awareness about the importance of having the health sector as a strategic partner. So for us uh, in Promundo and here in Portugal, the health sector is a key area for the promotion of active parenting. Everyday health professionals, of course, interact with families and this is pretty much based on data that we gathered using our images survey that I think Maryam will also go through the data from Georgia using the images uh, research. Uh, and they interact with families, often with mothers and fathers, in pregnancy surveillance, in delivery, postpartum, and in medical appointments of children between zero and four years old. So also pretty much important for early childhood development. And traditionally, there is a tendency to interact more with the mother, as we know, especially in reproductive and sexual health processes, uh, where men are less involved or, or called upon to participate. In Portugal, next please, uh, we have this specific program from the government called Mobilizing Initiative for a Caring and Involved Fatherhood. It's a national public uh, policy from the Ministry of Health. It's called IMPEC. And uh, the aim of this IMPEC uh, program is to develop within the National Health Service, uh, responses to better support and empower men as self-determined persons in sexual and reproductive rights and as protagonists uh, in the care work of their child, particularly during the first two decades of life, alongside women and in interaction with these. So, next please. Um, the, our parent program, um, in the very beginning of, of the, the methodology development partnered with the health ministry. And so it will become a part of this national strategy uh, targeting men as caring fathers and in the promotion of gender equality. Uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity and of course it changes from country to country. We went through the same experience in Brazil and we know that uh, the changes in governments can interrupt these uh, sort of good practices, but I wanted to share with you that here this is the, the, the path that we've been uh, adopting in terms of guaranteeing the sustainability of the program at the mid and long terms. Uh, we can uh, talk a little bit more about the program and the major challenges that we face at this moment later, Constantine. Thank you. And I leave you with a, a picture of our national campaign uh, and is my, my younger son and my partner. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Mariam. Uh, I will give the floor to you now. Uh, UNFPA Georgia Country Office has been active in running since 2015 the Men Care Campaign. Tatiana also referred to the campaign, a global fatherhood campaign. What prompted you to start such a campaign in Georgia and how the campaign evolved during these years? Well, thank you um, for inviting me for this the webinar and uh, I'll, I'll try to give an overview of what happened and how the campaign actually developed. To begin with and to answer your question here is that 
This is, we are working as UNFPA Georgia to promote gender equality in this country. And we cannot speak about women's empowerment and supporting women unless we involve men as the allies in this process. This cannot be achieved without the assistance, without their help. Therefore, Men Care Campaign was a right um, initiative to implement in the country to strengthen the uh, gender equality agenda overall. Now, the campaign itself um, is aimed to promote men's involvement as equitable, nonviolent fathers and caregivers, and overall to support gender equality. Throughout the years, uh, the campaign has um, gone through the changes. And before we actually start uh, outlining the main activities that we have done so far, I would like to mention that the campaign has changed over the years. And this has been all based on a research, first of all. With the help of Promundo, we first did our images back in 2014, which basically triggered the certain steps of the Men Care campaign. So the first um, chunk of information that we uh, based our campaign on was mostly con concentrating on the involved fatherhood. And that was deliberately done. Because um, back then, it was very difficult to speak about the gender equality itself. So we tried to find an issue that would resonate positively in the population. That would be a safe ground to, do, to, to start the conversation with. So the first accent of the first stage of the campaign was therefore involved fatherhood. However, we then went further on and the next stage uh, was about the responsible partnership. So that we started promoting and pushing the initiatives that triggered and that um, kind of uh, uh, encouraged people to be more involved as the partners in the family. The next stage afterwards was mostly about the family friendly policies and promoting the paternity leave, parental leave in the country, both on the policy level and on the uh, grassroots level as well. And basically this is where we stand right now at this point. As for the future of the campaign, we, we have some certain ideas and the first um, and the most important will be tackling toxic masculinities. Uh, next slide, please. And if I may, I will share just a brief information about the evidence that we based all our activities on. And I specifically uh, selected this one because this gives us a um, comparison between back in 2013 and 19 and how the perceptions changed. Georgia is the country where changes happen and very rapidly, believe me. Uh, you may see on the slide, uh, it might be like six, eight percent, but that's a huge percentage considering the size of the population in terms of the beliefs. Next slide, Constantina, please. And I will just recap this with, with the saying that we have monitored through these researches that we have done throughout 2014 and then repeated in 2019 that the perceptions do change. Based on a well-targeted campaign, the population changes their attitudes towards things. However, what was very interesting, behavior change was lagging behind and that was very well shown by the research. That was very informative for us as the, uh, as the, um, you know, for the future programming that because we have to change now and link the, the attitude change with the behavior change. And that, that's the challenge for the campaign that we want to respond to. I would like to share a few activities. And while I was thinking about that, I was selective, very selective, and tried to uh, pick out those activities that resonated very well and basically triggered some personal emotions among the public that we saw that was mostly successful uh, in Georgia. Uh, next slide, please. And the very first thing that we started with, with was the prime time dads. That was the initiative that was basically a reality show where the father was left alone at home with the kids with no support whatsoever so that they have to do the household chores, take care of their kids. And it was amazing the results of, the, of this initiative because we saw fathers how their attitudes changed regarding perception of the women's jobs at home. That they thought that women were just resting at home doing nothing. They basically realized how, how tough work it is, how difficult it is to be a mother, to be a housewife and to do all this stuff. Um, we saw the um, uh, figures and we saw how public positively perceived that, but that was exactly resonating on, on, the, on the positive vibes and on the, on the positive emotions of the people about the reward being, whatever, what a rewarding job 
is to be a father in the family and specifically an involved father. Next slide, please. Uh, another one is a man talking to men training sessions, which, which was basically also um, based on the Promundo's um, technical assistance. This is a safe place for men, where there's only for men though, when they sit and discuss certain issues regarding gender equality. Um, this is a safe ground because no women is admitted in the room so they can openly discuss um, everything uh, about that. And they discuss issues about masculine, masculinities, household responsibilities. One activity that I would quickly want to mention here was that they had to calculate the uh, work that the women do at the job, at, at work, I mean, sorry, uh, the families. And plus, what would be if they had hired a person to perform their job? And when they saw in a monetary wise what was the result, people attending were amazed, really. So that, that was another type of the activity and which we're still implementing this uh, in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, public book reading. This is mostly concentrated on the involved fatherhood. So that based on the research, we saw that a uh, little percentage of the fathers are actually involved in the everyday life of their kids. They're not reading. They're not playing. They're not helping them with their assignments. So this is famous fathers sitting in Georgia and reading specific fairy tales or something to, to, to the kids to set an example for the ordinary parents out there. Next slide, please. Um, Father's Day, which was one of the um, contribution of the campaign. We, uh, I heard that some of, some of you have, uh, have, have written down, celebrate the fathers, recognize, uh, being, recognize the um, uh, fathers in the family, right? So this is the day that we uh, celebrate involved fatherhood, and this was done through the campaign. Next slide, please. Um, a football players, because we know that, the, the, I mean, this, is, this goes with the, with the development of the campaign and this particular initiative uh, targets at setting an example and establishing the role models, but at the same time to, to encourage more women's involvement in the field. They are considered to be manly and for boys only. So this is, uh, uh, this is the initiative dedicated to that. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the Father's Cup that you see on the, on the slide. And this is a very um, uh, interesting initiative. Fathers have to, uh, I mean, design the teams where there are boys and girls playing. So fathers are coaches and the boys and girls are playing together to promote the equality among genders. Next slide, please. Uh, this was the Frankfurt Book, Book Festival and um, this was the publication that we um, actually uh, portrayed here during the campaign. And on the next slide, you're gonna see the three publications that we actually uh, displayed during this event and the, 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 these were designed within the campaign. Next slide, please. Uh, from then on, we started now, obviously we were involving the celebrities in the project, but then we concentrated on the ordinary people. We wanted to portray usual men, usual Georgian people in the parks, playing with their kids and setting examples. So this was the photo uh, exhibition uh, uh, called Fathers from Streets of Tbilisi, where we tried to gather all these um, pictures of, of the ordinary people um, uh, spending time with their kids and um, uh, being involved. Next slide, please. Fathers block, the same thing, where basically fathers were writing letters to their kids. And this was, we were receiving, um, I mean, immense number of the, uh, of the letters within this initiative. Next one, please. Um, cooperation with the media, which was another, yet another direction in terms of the um, dedicating a certain articles uh, in the journals, in the newspapers. Next, please. Um, photographers against gender equality. These were the billboards basically po posted in almost um, all country, but mostly in certain regions where we, we saw these uh, main disparities. As I said, this is very briefly, and this is a nutshell of the campaign, and this does not even give a glimpse of the whole work that we do, but I will be happy to uh, give you and provide more information. You see my contact information, so I'll be more than happy to share additional information about the development of the campaign. Thank you at this point, and over to you, Constantine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. And uh, before we move on to our next panelists, I would like to ask uh, my colleague, Kolesi, do you have any questions from the audience? 
Well, I have a question for Tatiana. Um, how did you have to adapt your program because of uh, COVID-19? So uh, we went through, I think me and uh, everybody, everyone who, who works on intervention programs and face-to-face -face intervention programs, we went through a three month uh, work of uh, adapting the, the program. So um, of course for the health sector, promoting fatherhood and caregiving uh, was not a priority anymore. As, as one of the colleagues from the Ministry of Health says, this pandemic swallows everything that was happening before uh, the, of course, the, the crisis. So it was not a priority anymore. It was um, really, it, it is until today, really challenging to keep the good work and good practices going. Mainly, let me give you just one example, during delivery, uh, I'm not sure how, how it is in your, in your countries, but in Portugal is not a priority anymore. And even some fathers are not allowed it to be there during uh, delivery, during birth. So most of the fathers during the last six months, they met their children on the day they left the maternity with the mothers. So this, this means uh, that fathers are still considered visits uh, and not part of the same equation as Constantina put it. So, um, so mothers are there, but of course for us, and uh, the, the main work that we need to do is to show that also fathers can be tested. And if they are negative, of course they can be there, they need to be there uh, and they, they cannot be considered as visits. So first of all, uh, start trying to avoid the backlash in terms of programs and national policies that already existed. And then in the second, uh, on the other end, uh, transforming everything that was face to face into digital. So all the groups of fathers became, uh, of course, Zoom sessions, <laughs> became Zoom sessions. All the training of health professionals became Zoom sessions. So they, we used the, the of course, online tools available to keep the work going and everything that was meant to be present face-to-face uh, uh, -face, but also some outputs now we are um, producing digital platforms so that fathers and couples parents and the health professionals can go there and get the same information they did if they went through the face-to-face uh, sessions. So basically, we went through this digital transformation to keep the work to keep the work going. Um, it was it was a huge challenge, and but now I think the government um, stepped back in terms of um, not allowing uh, fathers to to be there during birth, and I I think now in this like so-called second wave and this new state of emergency, uh, things are more balanced and uh, the issue of fatherhood and caregiving uh, became all, again uh, at least to be uh, in the public in the public agenda. So and um, I'm, and besides that of course all the, the, the mental um, health issues that could uh, arise from from this social and physical distancing. Not sure if I answered your question, but this, I mean, from our experience from the field, these, at least these two uh, parts of the project were uh, transformed and readapted. And we know that we still face lots of political challenges because uh, fatherhood and caregiving and my, the focus on masculinities is not a priority in the middle of um, these global pandemics. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, we also received one question, uh, and it is, both, uh, it is addressed to both of you. If we have any data and any information about how, uh, how fathers with children with disabilities may be involved in their daily lives and in their education and upbringing, I don't know if any of you has any information about this. Um, I mean, the images that we have conducted, for example, did have several questions about the um, disabilities uh, and the uh, taking care of the uh, kids with disabilities. Um, 
I mean, not much information was generated at that point because it was a couple of questions, frankly speaking. And I, I believe that will be a specific and a targeted um, research that has to be done in that regards because that's a very specific issue uh, that needs kind of a more different approach in terms of the research. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Tatiana, do you have something to add? Uh, I, I second uh, what Mariam has said. As Ma Ma Mariam said, uh, I don't have that kind of data. I do have for specific groups, for example, for uh, parents of uh, children autist, with autism children, but uh, from Portugal. I don't have general data. But I also saw that you have other questions about data um, and I would recommend to, to, to check the IGAS website, the European Institute for Gender Equality, in terms of um, general data, because the question here on the chat is on increase, increases in domestic violence. So you have data um, from um, each country at European level. If you go there to the website, you have all these studies there. But no, I don't have an answer for the, 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 first, uh, the first question for the specific okay. needs. Thank you both. And I would like to kindly ask our panelists to also address any questions that come in uh, using the chat box. And uh, of course, we will be having uh, two more rounds of open questions later. And now I would like to give the floor to Alona and Joseph, uh, who will present the Hope Magic Moments campaign. Alona, welcome. Can you please give us an overview of the Hope uh, Magic Moments campaign you are running in Israel? And uh, how did you target to create a behavior change to fathers? Yeah. Um, the idea for Magic Moments was to find a way to make a large scale impact on parents. Uh, we did not uh, do a specific uh, differentiation between mothers and fathers. We addressed parents as a whole. Uh, but from our research, we could, uh, to, we could learn some uh, differences, which we will share on later video. The idea behind Magic Moment was that we are all with a lack of time. Parents are feeling more and more pressed with the necessity to uh, work, to, to, to deal with all the many things that they want to have for their children. And we wanted to take a different approach. We wanted to say, with the time that you have, not changing your job, not, go, not moving to the necessary to the country, with the time that you have and in the lifestyle that you lead, take the routine moments and turn them into a magical moments. Use the time of a routine activity for uh, giving your child something that will assist his development and also cultivate your ties with him. The objectives were, uh, first of all, creating a public awareness of the importance of the early childhood phase in, the, in a person's life, because uh, I think in, in Israel for sure, but I think in many other countries, there is not a, rec a full recognition of the importance of this age and, and the necessity to invest in this uh, critical age, the importance of the ties of, between parents and children, and, and actually creating content that would support a behavioral change. The campaign was aimed at parents, but uh, being a media company that has TV channels in Israel, we, we created content that was aimed to children, to professional caregivers, but all aiming to the parents. Next, please. So we created uh, for the children, a series of 10 uh, episodes showing different families on their daily routine where a magic moment happens. We created for parents, uh, for different platforms, uh, 30 episodes of short documentaries with uh, experts uh, commenting on uh, footage of, of real families and 45 how-to-do videos. We can... Uh, in addition to the, to, to the content, we also had to think of the right platforms. So except for our own platforms, like the television channels and sites, uh, we had a mini site for parents, for children, we, we created specific uh, platforms like 32 WhatsApp groups that were set up in, during COVID-19 because we felt that was an immediate way to reach parents and send into their phone an immediate suggestion of what we can do today. 
So that was one way, uh, Pinterest, uh, uh, social networks, uh, and so on. We can move ahead. So in terms of the reach, uh, on television, uh, we, uh, we had 100% uh, percent exposure on the viewers that we uh, address, which are children. But on the digital, the overall reach was 1.6 million. I, we did some cooperation with press, with the written press. So a press that has a circulation of 500, 550,000 uh, copies. And uh, this was the extent of the engagements on the social media. And on YouTube, we had 1 million views for, our, for the content we uh, produced. So on this, we felt that we've already reached on a large scale. Next, please. But what was most important for us was what kind of impact we can create. And for this, we wanted to also create a network of partners. Uh, so the, it was, it's, it's rather a large network by now. Uh, for instance, on the private sector, we did a cooperation with a supermarket chain in which we suggested uh, where for the parent that was visiting in the supermarket, there were different suggestions in the different departments of things he can suggest to his child to pay attention while the parent is doing his uh, purchasing. Or in health educations, we were in contact, uh, of course, with the, like the local uh, early childhood centers. Local municipalities, we've created with already three municipalities, activities in parks. And, and a really a very big network. I won't go into it at the moment. Uh, can we move to the next one, please? Um, the research that accompanied us was conducted by the Center of Educational uh, Technology and some of the key findings was, first of all, the, the bottom line was that there was a clear impact on parents on all the major parameters that we aimed for. That was an, an increase in the knowledge, in the parental knowledge, increase in the frequency of the activities, increase in the sense of parental self-efficiency, and, and, and a, a dramatic growth, I would say, in the parents' uh, report of the implementation of the daily joint activities they do, and which was what we aim at. Now to the question of the differentiation between mothers and fathers. First of all, it was very interesting for us and unexpected, to be frank, that there was a difference of platforms and different of content. Um, the mothers who still feel, uh, as also you mentioned in your uh, researches, had more uh, self-confidence in their abilities, uh, were looking for practical advice, give me new ideas, give me a good idea what to do when I'm driving the kid to school, give me an idea what I can do while I'm preparing dinner, and so on. The fathers uh, wanted more information that uh, dealt with their well-being, how they can feel better as a parent, and how they can enjoy the time better. Uh, it was also interesting that in another part of the research, uh, fathers put up much higher uh, 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 the, their feeling that there was a lot of stress uh, within uh, family, uh, family time with the children, more than the mothers. Um, so there was a difference in the content they wanted, but there was also a difference in the media. Fathers, YouTube was clearly uh, father dominated with 73% uh, fathers on, the, on YouTube. Um, and uh, the next, can you move me, me to the next time? And what we found interesting that on social media, uh, if you will look at the first uh, graph, it shows the difference of the engagement on social media. So there's the uh, likes uh, that, are, that are a very liked and undirect response or engagement. And there's a very strong jump in the engagement uh, starting uh, December. And that was, we think, because of a cooperation we did with a very large Facebook fathers group. It's a, it's a group that has 250,000 fathers. They're usually very cynical, but we managed to do a very good cooperation with them. And you can see below 
the differences between phase one and two in the, in the amount of uh, direct uh, engagement with the content that was shown. And we related to that cooperation. Uh, when we, this is just some examples from the research. Uh, when we checked uh, uh, parental knowledge and skills, there's of course, the, we, we, show, we saw a difference with the fathers and mothers. But of course, there is still a difference between the mothers and fathers. So on, uh, on the um, statement of I feel uh, I advance my child during daily routine, mothers were 53 towards 40. Parents were being mothers were 45 to 37. And, uh, and, when I, and, and when we look at the actual implementations, so uh, there, there was a clear uh, growth in all the examples that we asked about, all the activities that we asked about, but, but still, of course, mothers is a higher uh, percentage. Okay. Um, we finished the first phase of our project, which was, co which was content that we produced in Hebrew. And now we're in the midst of the second phase, which is creating magic moments in Arabic. And uh, I invite uh, Joseph, my colleague, to, to share with you where we stand. Thank you, Alona. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for inviting us to be part of this. Um, you know, Alona, what's funny? I tried to check the names of the participants from different cultures, so I'm not sure, but I'm totally convinced that women are dominating also this session. So men even didn't care to come to uh, watch us talking about them. That's, uh, that's a woman issue, it depends, it looks like. Um, hi, I'm Joseph. I'm, I'm heading Lahazatna al-Hilwi. Lahazatna al-Hilwi, it's the Arabic version of magic moment. In Hebrew, we call it Regaye Kesem. In Arabic, it's Lahazatna al-Hilwi. And uh, the first thing that comes into your mind when you look into... Uh, to uh, different languages, Hebrew and Arabic, that there is a need to adapt because of language issues, or you need to do a project for different, uh, two, two different audiences that speaks different language because of the language. But uh, there is a different reason, actually, because uh, mo most, most of the Arabs, the Arabs are the Arab speaking people or the uh, Palestinians who lives in Israel are 20% of the Israeli population. So we're looking at 20% of the Israeli population with um, different media behavior and consumption, media consumption behavior, sorry, with uh, different uh, cities and uh, areas that living at. We're looking at a different culture at all. So when you look at it, it's not a language issue because most of them do speak Hebrew, but there's a very uh, big difference in terms of how they consume media, why they consume media, and uh, the media platforms they're using. So the Arabic version is not a translation. The Arabic version is an actually continuous, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural continuous of the Hebrew version, but it's an actual new project that we call the Hazat al Hilwa that is keeping the same objectives of the Hebrew campaign. But in order to make it like really interesting, we want to keep you thirsty and hungry. So we decided to split the presentation into two presentations. Uh, the first one, we give you like this general overview about the Hazat al and Regaya Kesem. And in the second part, I'll come back and I'll speak how we did the adaptation. Now I finish and I move back to you. Thank you, Zazette, and we are looking forward to hear uh, uh, the factors that determine uh, how uh, you will tailor the approach. Um, uh, I would like to ask my colleague, Olesia, if we have any questions from the audience. Uh, yes, we actually have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, because my, my headphones. We have actually a question. Um, how can uh, someone easily get fathers together in areas with limited social media, like, for example, in Uganda? I'm not sure I understood the question. Alona, did you understand it? No, sorry. So can you repeat it or re... re, re it's written yeah. on, the, on the chat. It's written on the chat. How can I easily get fathers together in areas with limited social media? Like here in Uganda, I'm thinking about what would also limited internet. 
uh, First, probably. you need to solve the pandemic issue. After you solve the pandemic issue, uh, I think Miriam all, all already solved it. Like uh, football, anything that looks like a, a, a man activity, something with testosterone or something with, with a lot of uh, uh, things that are many. So, uh, 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 not, so if there is no social media, go to sports, football or any anything that makes us feel good and uh, us as men yeah us <laughs> feel good this is this might be a good option other option that we're looking at now is trying to go to some uh, um, uh, groups of men that are associated to uh, like like lawyers or CPAs or things like that where you can find it kind of jobs that are dominated by men and if you look to those uh, societies that uh, are uh, gathering uh, or the unions that are gathering jobs that are men oriented maybe you can help use those helps in order to get use of those groups to get them together into something but this only after a few of the pandemic of course Alana, i think you want to also jump in i i think in principle it's always better to to do reverse engineering get to know where the fathers are what is, their, what is their preferred uh, means of getting information, official or non-official, and then tap into that. I think that's my best uh, suggestion. Constantine, if I may quickly add in here. Yeah, sure, um, sure. For example, I mean, with this same problem, though we do have this internet connection and the social uh, media widely ap uh, applicable to everybody, uh, for example, schools were the entrance point for us as well, because um, school was a reliable partner uh, that called actually parents to come to, to school and attend a parent meeting or something like that. So for us, for example, school besides sport was another entry point. Thank you. Good. And of course, I think Tatiana will jump in now and uh, mention the importance of the health sector, and especially if we are uh, discussing for younger children, like uh, pediatricians and uh, hospitals and uh, prenatal visits, Tatiana? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a point of, of entry, uh, definitely. I mean, so, but uh, taking Mariam's answer, I mean, now it's, that's another challenge, for example, we cannot go into schools, even that. I mean, e even in countries where kids are going to school, we cannot go inside. So let me tell you just one episode from my life. Uh, I just met my, my baby's uh, educator last Friday because I had to go to school because he had fever. So I went there and met her for the first time. And this is the kind of challenge that we're facing. I mean, even the daily routines and daily information that we could get and even th that short period of time when and focusing on fathers, that fathers could go attend and at least talk for five or ten minutes we don't have that anymore so uh, i agree with joseph so first we need to solve the pandemic crisis and everything that came with that with it uh, and then use what used to work better but under this context I, I think that we have a lot to learn from organizations like alonas and joseph that already have lots of experience on social media and on reaching uh, big numbers of, of fathers parents uh, whatever to to if we are facing like this lockdown and if you cannot contact people face to face but of course internet connection is a, a huge barrier and a world obstacle uh, and so I don't know how to, how to answer that because it's the same in, in Brazil. If we look at the favelas, at the, the shantytown slums in, in Brazil, in, we, we have projects running there and the internet connection is challenging. So, for example, Promundo in Brazil adapting our program P there, the, the work with fathers and with the health sector, they, of course, they, they need, they have to buy these groups of fathers some good internet connection so that they keep the work going. So let, let's not assume that everybody has this huge 5G Wi-Fi <laughs> wi and, and can have access to, to that. But definitely, I mean, the health sector and all the moments that we can engage men and fathers in particular are good entry points to, to promote uh, gender justice and caregiving.
if I may add on this, uh, before, before the internet came to our life, like in the late 90s and the beginning of 2000, I, I was lucky to be an advertiser in the advertising industry at, the, at this stage of this movement from, from analog or from physical uh, uh, advertising to digital advertising. So we used to do, to, to use two, three uh, methods, ATL, BTL, OTL. The ATL is the above the line, it's TV, billboards, news, uh, newspapers, all, all the things that you can see. And BTL, what we used to call below the line. This is the physical activities that we used to go and meet people, give them brochures or do activities, do parties and things like that. When the internet came, we, new, new exp exp expression came to our life, which is OTL on the line. So, and the OTL actually killed the BTL. So places like Uganda, I believe that the media, uh, uh, the media should be like, we should think about media and approaching media campaigns or any campaign uh, the way we used to approach it in the late nineties, beginning of 2000 was looking at the BTL as a, as a major uh, part or major portion of the invest in the media. So you need to go to the below the line thinking about how you can touch people and get people involved and engaged through actually meeting them, giving them something to go back to their homes or, or, or any way just to remember that you exist and uh, to come to, to, to the activities. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for your contribution and we will come back to the discussion. Uh, Tatiana, I would like to come back to you. Um, during the, and I think there was also a question uh, about that um, uh, uh, on the Q&A section. During the last uh, months uh, when the, the pandemic started, uh, we see quite frequently references in the literature and um, in the press uh, that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic may be an opportunity uh, for responsible cooperating. So from your experience, uh, how much things have changed in terms of unpaid care work and further engagement during this uh, crisis? Thank you, Constantina. Uh, some, some of, some of, the, the, <clears throat> of the questions and some of the answers were already mentioned. Uh, but, and I'm going to, to base uh, some reflections on, on um, the studies I mentioned before, and particularly the State of the World's Fathers 2019, for those who have curious, curiosity there on the suggested readings. Also the study on masculinities and COVID-19, written by uh, Sandy Rexton and Stephen Burrell, uh, and the study by Oxfam US and Promundo, and Promundo US on, the, on care work during COVID-19, and everything is online, so if you, if you want to, to learn more, you can you can check them. So uh, just to give you a, a general uh, idea, COVID-19 has impacted work lives, of course, but with the most significant toll falling on the lowest income households. Uh, this is obvious, but we need sometimes to have data to state that. Uh, the pandemic has led to an increase and often of many hours a day in care work demands. And under COVID, we are squeezing more care work into the day at the expense of rest, creative work and connection. Also, um, increased care demands are obviously uh, falling to women as an extension of the uh, unequal normal. So there was an increase, of course, in, in, in care work, but the toll is again falling on women. And while anxiety, uh, anxiety and stress are widespread, life under social distancing has a different emotional toll for women and for men. Of course, there's a lot of research to be done in the near future, but we already uh, can see that. So why it is uh, important now to discuss masculinities and care work, of course, fatherhood is a part of this discussion about masculinities and caregiving is not the only uh, debate uh, around that. But we need to focus, particularly now, we, we talk a, a lot about, I don't like the concept, but toxic masculinities. So let's, let's talk about the opposite and the need to focus on healthy masculinities, particularly in times of pandemics. 
We saw, and uh, it was already mentioned, that gender-based violence increased in uh, almost every, every country. Uh, violence against children also uh, increased in almost every country where we have data. And factors such as loss of income, insecurity, loss of mobility and other risk factors and, and others, other factors that are risk factors for violence perpetrated by men, as we were mentioning before. They were already before the pandemics, but due to the context, they increase. And evidence shows, and this is some research carried out by Promundo for the last 15 years, that witnessing violence during childhood has lifelong consequences. So we can talk about intergenerational transmission of violence. And what we need to be uh, aware is, is that as well as we can talk about intergenerational transmission of violence, we can talk about intergenerational transmission of care and gender equality. So we need to be uh, aware of these specifically if we are locked in our household with our children um, during these, these months. Conversely, of course, we know that boys whose fathers were involved in care uh, are more likely uh, to do so once they became fathers or adults. So it's also something that we need uh, to be aware of and to prevent um, violence and uh, inequality in the near future. And men have an important role in preventing violence. I started by saying that uh, and sharing care and promoting gender equality and especially now course, it was a mandatory, it's a mandatory lockdown. Some men stayed at home and they took care of their kids for the first time. But of course, come on, the same with me. I'm a mother and I have a full-time job. It was also the first time that I stayed at home. Uh, this um, huge amount of days and hours <laughs> and Joseph the other day was celebrating the, the, the school opening. <laughs> and so I, I, we know what that, that is. Uh, and so, but it is also something new for us mothers, but it's the first time, it was the first time that both mothers and fathers were, mothers and fathers live in the same household, that, that they worked together and that they were, they were able to share uh, the care work and domestic work at home. Uh, of course, that now social isolation makes intervention more difficult. So we need to, to be creative. Um, so I think that now we have the, this huge opportunity. Uh, I'm not going to say that COVID-19 uh, produced more equal fathers or more equal men. We don't have data to say that. And I honestly, I'm not sure uh, we will have that kind of data. Well, I want to, uh, to underline is that we faced a crisis of care and that became very, very quite visible during this context and that we need to put care in the center of the political debates, not only unpaid care work, care as a concept in general. Uh, and I think this is the, the major um, element to be discussed in the near future, the importance of care and how invisible this unpaid or informal caregiving was before the pandemics. And so I, I think that it's a matter now of discussing uh, economics and the economics of care. Thank you, thank you very much, Tatiana. Mariam, I would like to get back to the Men Care campaign in Georgia. And uh, it would be great if you could um, tell us a little bit about what were the success factors uh, of the campaign and also during the first part of uh, your presentation um, you presented the many different um, uh, stakeholders you mobilized in order to reach your objectives how so how instrumental that mobilization was right uh, yes um, I mean first of all regarding the success of the campaign and I think I have already briefly mentioned that is um, the uh, finding a positive angle of the campaign that was crucial in our regard, right? The thing was that um, gender equality was very controversial issue back then. So we had to find um, um, an area we where the majority of the population would be on the same page. And fatherhood would, was exactly the issue that nobody would debate, right? That was something that was acceptable for 
uh, conservative uh, uh, part of the society and a more kind of the uh, liberal part of the society as well. The another thing that I would mention here is that we did not have um, uh, in mind to achieve changes overnight. And we still don't think towards that. I mean, it's impossible. We are talking about the perception change and a behavior change that does not happen overnight. There, that's why through involving different stakeholders, we wanted to um, expand the group of people that would become supporters and the allies in the process, starting with the football players, politicians, those were all the kind of a role models for us, but then we started also engaging the regular people, regular fathers in this process. The last couple of slides that I have here is basically also uh, a response to the previously discussed issues in terms of the pandemics and how it affected the, uh, the, 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 the overall course of the campaign. The thing is that we continue, but we, 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 we change the channel of of um, our means of communication. Unfortunately, as, as it was raised here, this is not available everywhere in terms of the social media and internet connection. But for us in Georgia, that was the key um, en entry point. We started um, uh, airing some episodes on national TV. We started using social media extensively. We created a father's group. If you can turn on the next slide, for example, you will see that there is a father's group um, that actually generated, um, uh, gathered regular people all around the country, and they started discussing their stories, how they dealt with pandemics, what they did with their kids. They shared their ordinary life stories, and the group has become extensively popular. Tatiana, you saw that, or it was Alana, that mostly it was a cynical comment that, that, that were encountered, but not in our case, by the way, because men found the uh, platform where they could actually get a good advice from other men as well without being uh, afraid to be mocked, uh, mocked and laughed at. And the funny story is that uh, we were the other day approached by the, one of the utility companies, for example, saying it's a winter coming. So there are a lot of incidents of the gas leakage, for example. And they said that we know that there is a group, uh, a father's group, and we know that there are a lot of people. So can we post an advertisement or any information on that about the utility? But that also indicates that this kind of the channel becomes popular. Fathers and men, whatever their level of masculinity might be, they need a safe place for a discussion. And once they find that, they will get involved. As I said, unfortunately, it's not the case everywhere in terms of the um, availability of the internet. But as I said, we need to be open-minded, try to find alternative solutions. And I completely agree after the end of pandemic because health comes first and uh, we have to tackle that before we, we start working on any other possible issues. But on the other hand, this might become a new normal. We have to find the ways that will make us adjust to this new reality. The pandemics might not go anywhere for a while, so we cannot stop working in this regard. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank All you, right. Mariam. Now, Joseph, we are looking forward to hear uh, what factors determined uh, the way you adapted uh, uh, the uh, campaign uh, you're running in Israel in order to address the Arabic population. So, uh, as as Alona mentioned in the very like in the very first slides, it's it's a mass media campaign. So when when we came to this campaign, we had a a very simple idea in our mind. The first idea is having a, uh, a, or raising the awareness of the importance of early childhood for the kids' future, and this is the first one. And the second one is not no, just move back to the slide. Just stay in the and and the, and the second one is creating a behavioral and conceptual change in the parents' minds. This is the same way we came into the Hebrew campaign and the Arabic campaign. And so, so, and, and the, the tool is mass media because we wanted to create in a, a very big scale, a change in a very big scale. So the, the tool is mass media. So when you come to mass media, the measurements are media measurements. How many, how, how did you, how, how, how is the exposure? How many users, how many, sorry, followers, how many viewers, how many eyeballs watched your content? This is the first one. And secondly, happily we are, because Bernard Van Leer's 
the way of thinking. We are uh, working side by side with a very prestigious Israeli uh, a research company that is doing the research in parallel to what we're doing in order to measure the change in the, beha the behavioral change and the conceptual mm -hmm. change in the parents. So we're doing both. We're doing the media and we have a, a, a research company that is doing the research in parallel and we're feeding each other. We're feeding them with what we're doing and they're feeding us, us with the outcomes of the research in order to shape the content and the campaign uh, distribution uh, funnels and uh, uh, ways in order to, to get the maximum results from the campaign. Now I lost two minutes from my time to answer this question, but I will go to my slide. So you can go to the second slide. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so Maryam, we're sharing a lot of common problems and opportunities in the Arabic uh, population in Israel comparing to the Georgian uh, population. As you can see, 93% of the women are the main caregiver and 95% uh, of them are staying at home when the kid is sick. So parents are not doing this and 76% of the mothers are the primary responsible for picking up the children. This creates like a, wow, there's an opportunity there of 24%. No, 9% of the men doing the 21% or the rest of the percentages the uh, grandpops are doing this. Uh, uh, and and uh, we, we can see from our focus groups that men are saying that they're busy, they're going very early in the morning, going back in order to bring some money the, uh, uh, to home. The income, the level of income in the Arab population is lower than the, the Jewish population, so there is a need to go and work for more uh, uh, hours in order to bring enough money to your home. So th this is a situation, the unemployment level in the a uh, women's side is uh, is uh, is uh, very high. Only 42 or 41 percent of the women, a lot of women in Israel are, uh, uh, are working. So the the biggest the biggest part are not working. Men are going out. So th this is this is the start point uh, that that we're going. This is these levels are higher than the levels that are in the Jewish uh, uh, market. Go to the next slide. And uh, we did some focus groups in order to understand men's perceptions and what's going on during the pandemic. So if in the first answers, when we ask them about their life before the pandemic, they say that they are working 12 hours a day and going from very early in the morning and coming back late. In this slide, we can see that during the pandemic, the first father says that we were forced to be at home. The first one saw the opportunity that the uh, it, that, that the uh, uh, pandemic or the COVID-19 teach him that he is able to do something with the kids and be in the, with the kids in order to use this time to, uh, 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 to, to uh, 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 better education and better communication between him and the kids. And the other or the downside of this is uh, as, as we spoke about the violence and the uh, the, the fact that men are there, they are not used to be there, not only the men, also the kids and the women are not used to be together for such long time during the pandemic. So there is the downside of divorce and violence. In Israel, for example, someone asked about the numbers in the uh, Israeli or anywhere in the place of the home violence. The home violence in Israel increased by 768% during the pandemic uh, uh, in the Arab and the Jewish uh, uh, community. So this is, this is the, this is the hidden pandemic that is an outcome of the pandemic. So we have the fathers from one hand seeing the opportunity and the fathers from the other hand seeing the downside of, of this pandemic. We can go to the next slide. So we came to this situation and we need to take a, Jew, a Hebrew campaign in order to address a different audience. I mentioned before that it's 20% of the market. So how, how we can do it? How, 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 how you adapt such a campaign when you come to it. Firstly, you need to keep, keep the first, uh, the same objectives because this is the idea of doing one campaign for different audiences, keeping the same objectives, but culturally adapting it. The culture affect the content. For example, if you go to Alona's slide, the, uh, the very early slide was a gay family. Which, which is normal and, uh, for the Jewish community. But if you come to the Arab community, which is a more conservative community, a gay family wouldn't be something that we would use. We didn't use gay families. There are gay families, but it's taboo and it's, it's not, it's not uh, uh, common in our community. So we couldn't 
uh, use such families. So this is the content and the uh, casting that you change according to the needs of the different uh, audiences. And the distribution uh, funnels. Hope Media owns one of the biggest or the biggest children's TV channel in Israel that is distributed over uh, Yes and Hot, the two biggest cable and satellite companies. That's great, but there are zero Arab families that are watching those channels. In order to get the Arab families, you need medias, but there is no TV that, that targets the Arab audience in Israel. So we needed to change the media. Once you change the media or the distribution uh, funnels, that change the format. Because for TV, you need 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes or even 10 minutes of content for uh, digital media in order to approach uh, the Arab families where the uh, online is very uh, uh, common. You need a very short segments of 20%, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or two minutes pieces of content. So this is what we did. Go to the next slide. When we started to uh, think about this campaign, the, comp the COVID-19 wasn't here. We were uh, like uh, early November 20, uh, 2019. So the COVID wasn't here. We thought about all the stakeholders and all the BTL activities. So we wanted to be with uh, uh, in the clinics with the parents and in, in ev everywhere where parents are in the parks and doing even a very big uh, launching event during Ramadan and things like that. Of course, COVID came and all the uh, things changed. So we needed to adapt the campaign according to the COVID uh, restrictions. So that's changed the whole production. You will see how our, our production looked like at the, at the first COVID closing. And the content changed because if you want to be relevant, you have to be relevant to what's going on now. And what's going on now, it's totally different of what uh, there were uh, during uh, uh, the regular times. And timelines changed. We needed to launch the campaign earlier than what we used to do because parents are at home and now they need us. They don't need us three months. So we, instead, instead of waiting until, uh, I think it was need to, needed to be launched in the summer, we launched it during the spring. So we worked very fast in order to launch. So timelines was changed because of the COVID. Uh, go to the last slide. I know that I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. So I'm, I'm uh, Tatiana, I'm finishing. The last slide is the outcome. So the outcome, uh, uh, we, you have three pieces of content here. The left side, uh, where you see this uh, nice father, his name is Ayman Nahas, he's a comedian, that, uh, uh, a, a, a famous comedian in uh, uh, Israel, a famous uh, Palestinian comedian. And, uh, but he wasn't comedian in our content, he was a father. This is, was the idea. We wanted to target fathers and to change the perceptions of fathers that they are fathers, they are not lawyers, they are not advocates, they are not uh, a, 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 a workers, they are fathers also. So here we took Ayman Nahas as a comedian, but we put him as a father. And he spoke as a father that needs help because he's home now and he don't know what to do. So he, 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 he was hosting different families in his uh, live show. We did 10 live shows like those in Facebook Live. Uh, different families and different experts and we made sure that we have enough fathers and enough male experts in addition to the female experts to make sure that fathers feel uh, uh, natural to be in this place of being a father not being a man or being a, a hard worker. In the right side, up right side, no just my last to, so in the right top side, you can see this uh, uh, Mama Muna or Muna Shamshum. She is the host of our, by the way, our new program as well. Uh, we had during the first quarantine, uh, because of the closing and because we couldn't bring people together in order to uh, shoot videos. So we shoot videos via uh, Zoom and we had the Zoom sessions of experts that are speaking to the parents. The content wasn't about the COVID-19, but because it was shooted uh, uh, in Zoom, and it looked like Zoom, people felt, felt, felt that it's part of what's going on now. So the content can live forever, but the format is relevant. So we created a relevant format, but with content that can live forever. And finally, you can see down there a very sh a shiny picture, because now we can shoot outside. We went to, the, to, to homes, and we were shooting our next project, which we call um, Sawa, together. It's families that are doing family activities that part of their 
a daily routine and experts are giving uh, recommendations and content about what's going on. Uh, and the, the first, the, that's dairy and the five tips, the two contents that we already created have already reached to more than 2 million views in the Arabic community in Israel. It's very high because there are only 1.8 million Arabs. So if we talk, the, if we take about the uh, men and women that are parents from those that we're talking about 50%. So we have 1 million parents and we have 2 million views. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot in the Israeli market. I know in other markets it may sound uh, very, very low, but in our market, 2 million is very high. And also the numbers that Alona mentioned in terms of views in the TV and in uh, the social media for the Jewish community also are very high numbers for our market. It's a very small market, a country of 8 million people. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. Uh, uh, as we are running out of time, I would uh, kindly ask our panelists to use the Q&A box to address any questions we are receiving and to uh, move on to the uh, last parts of the webinar. Uh, I have a question uh, for all four of you and I would really ask for a very brief but powerful uh, answers. Uh, I would like to uh, give us one key message uh, that you draw from your experience today uh, and you would like to send uh, to all of us uh, that is related to responsible co-parenting and uh, involved fatherhood. Uh, shall we start with Tatiana? Yes, thank you. Um, it was very, a very interesting session, a very interesting webinar. Um, I would say that um, one of the strongest messages that we get from today, we got from today, is that it, it is still quite unclear um, what the long-term or mid-term effects uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 will be uh, in terms of, of caregiving. It is, of course, possible that the, that the pandemics may reshape uh, the division of labor, namely the gender division of labor, uh, and it is possible that some fathers um, will become, of course, more engaged that, than they were uh, before in the longer term. However, it is also possible that the pandemic could lead to a backlash in terms of gender uh, equality. And we already have some studies showing that. Uh, um, in one of Promodo's studies, there is this quote from a woman in the US saying, I feel like a 1950s housewife uh, because of this daily routine of staying like a staying home mom. And it can lead also to a huge backlash uh, in terms of gender equality or an, uh, yeah, inequality. Um, for example, because women will lose their jobs in greater numbers than, than men. We know that the first to lose their jobs are women or the, the ones that need to stay at home. And so we can uh, face in the near future the return to this breadwinner model, traditional model that we had during the 50s of the last century. Um, and also the second message that I get, and this is from me because I was thinking about that, that is it in, in political terms. So we can, the same way we can face a backlash uh, at the micro level, so at the household, we can also face a reactionary political uh, view and ideology that are coming back, like more right-wing extreme views that uh, promote this kind of approaches. So we need to be, uh, we need to pay attention to, to these dangers, that the daily practices and the number of hours that we spend taking care of ours and in our family can honestly lead to and like be used by these political discourses that promote this kind of war to the pandemics and um, become the, the new model and can grow in influence during, we're already seeing that, during and after the crisis. And as I said before, the message is we need to put care, the concept and the practice at the center of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Mariam, what would be your key message? 
Yes, thank you. And building on what Tatiana had uh, just said, uh, the thing is that the world changes as, as, we, as we speak, right? So we have a new normal. That will be a new normal and we need to adjust. I'm saying this from the campaign wise. We like it or not, we have to rethink our traditional approaches of um, leading the campaigns. We, find, we need to find the ways in which we reach out to those people out there that are in need. I totally agree with Tatiana that it will have a backlash. The pandemics will have a backlash on the society, on the families. But the thing is that the also a new normal is that not only men are breadwinners in the family in the modern world, even though that women are staying at home, they still work, they still support their families. Therefore, we have to underline this role of women as the breadwinners and not only the men, the sole heirs of the family. That would be more from the content wise of the campaign. But th this goes without saying, without men's involvement, we cannot overcome inequality in any of the countries. This needs a unanimous approach and this this goes without saying thank you thank, thank you mariam uh, alona but please keep it short because we are running out of time i i like what mariam showed us with the photographs of fathers in the public uh, uh, area with activities and i like the word adventure that you suggested because i'm i think that the situation of the pandemic is something that is not in our control, but the way we try and approach the, the given situation is in our control. And I think the tone of whatever messaging we do in whatever campaign, whether digital or below the line, I think we should be talking about the opportunity, the great opportunity that fathers have gained by, by this situation that they just can spend more time with their kids and, and enjoy their presence. I, I, I think it's very important to come from that side of how fun it is and how enriching it can be and not to be he too heavily on the moralistic side of don't do this or, or pull your share, which are of course very severe issues. But I think in terms of the efficiency of reaching father's hearts and, and creating a change, we have more of a chance if that will be our tone. Thank you. Joseph, what about you? I, I will echo Zalona's opportunity. I think there is an opportunity here. What COVID-19 what COVID did or what the pandemic did is it, it puts a spotlight in a very big problem of the gender inequality, we, which we sometimes we're taking for granted. Like we're happy that men are home. Usually women are home as well. So I, I think there's a great opportunity here. Men now, I think understood partly at least, that they are part of a family, that they are fathers before that they are men. They are not workers, they are fathers as well. Or they are firstly fathers. So there's, there's a huge opportunity to gain uh, experience, be there, enjoy from it, and have, have this practice being done in the future after the pandemic will, will, will be uh, a history. So uh, the pandemic is not here to stay. It, some, at some point, it, it will end. But the inequality won't end. So we need, to, we need to make sure that as much as men that will understand that at this point, this is something that they can do in normal times, we, we will be better in, in a better future. Thank you, Joseph. And now, thank you all for uh, your interventions and sharing your uh, exciting uh, uh, experience. Uh, before we close, I would like to invite uh, all participants to go back to Mentimeter. If you have logged out, please reconnect to www.menti.com and use the code 770200006. And I would invite you to write two words that can describe an action or something that you think can be done and lead to increased father engagement and responsible co-parenting. You can start typing now.
it's good that we see an opportunity behind these challenges and doing things together. And uh, it might be that this refers to different contexts. It could be doing things together, mothers and fathers, or uh, different professionals doing things uh, together in order to meet our objectives, media engagement and social media, role models, and go where fathers are, and evidence-based actions. Good, thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts, examples, ideas, empathy, and public policies. Public policies, I think, uh, from the, in the State of the World Fathers uh, report that Tatiana mentioned, uh, the role of public policies is uh, uh, highlighted, especially about how they can support the efforts of different organizations in the, um, uh, meeting the objectives of uh, bringing, uh, achieving more uh, engaged fatherhood. So thank you all for sharing uh, your thoughts. Uh, we reached the end of today's webinar. Dear panelists, thank you very much for accepting our invitation for your contribution and the time and the excellent collaboration we had. It was a pure pleasure to learn more about uh, your amazing work in promoting father engagement and responsive, uh, responsible co-parenting. Uh, your work is highly appreciated. Dear participants, thank you. Thank you for choosing uh, our webinar and investing your time in professional growth. We hope that we fulfilled your expectations and we look forward to continuing the conversation Soon you will find in your inbox recordings and further reading materials and all the links that you can use and also share among your networks. On behalf of the International Step-by-Step -Step Association and the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, stay safe, stay safe and healthy. And until we meet again in the next webinar, we say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.